Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Warsaw for our Capital Markets Day 2017. Uh, thank you all for making the journey across um, to snowy Warsaw. Um, to get the day started, uh, I'd like to invite Mark Wilson to the stage. Uh, before I do, I'll just do the usual uh, disclaimer. <laughs> Please kick us off. Well, morning everyone. Morning Chris. I thought you were going to read through it for a second. I'm glad you didn't. Um, we promised you snow. We delivered. Um, and we're promising a few more things today and we'll deliver on those as well. So we've called this session Cash Flow Plus Growth Upgraded. And you've seen this morning, we have upgraded uh, pretty much all of our targets. And uh, it was a good night last night. Um, it was good to see you so uh, uh, focused on the activities in, in Poland last night. Uh, there was a couple of fine vodkas, but you're obviously looking pretty chirpy this morning. So I, use, I guess you're used to that sort of um, uh, activity. Um, and I'm glad you've got clear heads because there's a lot to go through uh, today. Uh, essentially, we will be answering the questions that you and uh, the buy side have been asking. Uh, where will our growth come from? We're going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, what are we doing with debt? We're going to be crystal clear on that. And what are we going to do with all that surplus capital and cash we've built up, our cash pile? And lastly, uh, where's the dividend going? So those are the key questions have been asked, and we're going to answer them. And if you go away with nothing else but four messages today, I want you to take these four messages. First, we are upgrading our growth and cash targets, and these are very achievable. We haven't missed a target yet. I'll just make that point. Second, our earnings quality has improved markedly. We'll take you through the details of that. And as such, we're increasing our payout ratio. And Tom will spend a fair bit of time on that. Third, we have a very large pile of cash to deploy, uh, three billion to be precise, and that will reduce debt and increase earnings. Fourth, the quality of our remaining franchises is top draw. We've done a lot of disposals. And it's top draw both in the UK and internationally, and you'll see some of that today. That's the reason we're actually in Poland. We want to show you that. Now, because what happened? We had all these disposals. We had this group that was a bit of a mess. Um, and we've had all these disposals, and now what we have left is what I believe is great franchises, though, in good markets. Uh, and sometimes I think just how good they are historically has got lost in all the noise that surrounds results. But the other thing is that our results are also much, much simpler. I know a lot of you have commented on that. And they're clean and simple results, and so you can see it without the noise. Now, we've dragged you all the way to Poland, looking outside into white, snowy Poland, uh, because we want you to get to meet the team. Uh, there's a lot of uh, good noise and discussion last night. As you saw, we've brought a lot of our CEOs and some of our key team members in. We want you to get to know the depth of our team because frankly, the franchises are only as good as our team. Um, I'm hoping you like what you see. Um, and, and, but today is about shining the spotlight on a few things. It's about looking at the strength of these international businesses, because a lot of you haven't seen them. Remember, 42% of our earnings now are outside UK insurance, 42%, and which gives us um, a nice hedge, and it gives us a lot of diversity and we think we're in the right place with our perimeter. So today's presentation will cover four topics. I'll start by updating you on our ambitions and our strategy. Uh, that's first. Tom will take you through the financials, uh, particularly focusing on capital management and the strength there. On the international businesses, we've got Morris somewhere in front of me. Oh, there is Ron in front of me. And he'll provide you with an overview and we'll have breakout sessions with our leadership teams in Poland Canada and France, and we'll finish the day updating you on some tangible progress, proof points, with digital. Now, I know everyone has a digital strategy. Yeah, I get that. So today, this will be a show you uh, day on digital, not a tell you day. You will see our new IP, you will see our live products. 
that have just gone live a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I'll leave it to you to judge. Tell me what you think later on. So where are we? Well, we've delivered the fix. Uh, and I think we've delivered the fix and then some. We've exceeded every target we put out over the last few years. And now we have somewhat an embarrassment of riches, I guess, on our balance sheet. Uh, yeah, it was hard. Um, it took the vast majority of my team's time and my own time over a number of years. But now we are much leaner and much fitter. We've got much focus, much more focused, what we think are leading franchises, and we'll show you that today. So what I am saying is the pruning of our orchard is complete. The pruning of the apple trees is complete. We're now entirely focused on growing and strengthening the businesses. We have upgraded our growth forecasts. So on growth, our ambition is to do better than mid-single digit, and we'll cover, Tom will cover that in a bit more depth later. And it's very achievable. Our markets and large segments within those markets are growing well. And the fact is, you can see the results, you can see the market. The fact is, in particular large markets, we have picked up market share. We've picked up market share in most of the segments in the UK, for example, but it goes much wider than that. Now, just to be clear, market share isn't how we measure, but the market share and the growth and revenue is just a function of the fact of where we are as a group. Um, we also have the capacity, you know, we've got the appetite, we've got the balance sheet. You know, we were restricting our growth for a long, many years because we didn't have the balance sheet. We have the balance sheet, we have the capability, we have the team. And more importantly, in uncertain times, um, particularly in places like the UK, we have the brand. And when the times are a bit tougher, that's the big brands that attract the customer numbers. You can see that. And uh, I think we have now a bit of the innovation to also capitalise on the market opportunities, and we're, we're doing that. Now, capital, op capital optimization is a lever to also drive higher growth. And... Uh, also drive higher cash returns for shareholders. And as we were going through the fixed phase, it was quite hard to be specific on the numbers. It was hard because we didn't know exactly. There was always so much uncertainty and we built in a lot of extra contingencies to make sure we delivered. Now we're at the stage where our confidence levels are much higher. Um, you know, we've had solvency too for a few years. Um, we're pretty confident in what's happening. Every time we go through a set of numbers, we seem to get more than we thought we would. Um, that's a good problem. But what we're doing today is we're going to be much more specific on the numbers for you. Uh, then, then again, you be the judge. Um, we are telling you today how much cash is available. And we're putting numbers specifically around paying down debt, about investing in our businesses organically, and on returning capital. On earnings, the quality has improved markedly, and as such, as you read this morning, we are upgrading our dividend payout ratio target. Now, digital is also a key enabler of our increased growth ambition, and in fact, has been the key enabler of our growth this year. And uh, in some areas, it surprised us, and we'll talk about that later. Yeah, but the fact is, we've got leading market IP, and we're now bringing all these together in some pretty cool propositions. And what we're doing with that, we're particularly in the early days of that, we've been winning some big partnerships like HSBC. Put that as a tick in the digital column. But of course, digital isn't just about innovation and cool IP and products and distribution. It's also about efficiency and it's also about the customer service and particularly in the back office. And uh, I've been in Bristol and Sheffield recently and seen what they're doing with TCC and digital. And that's actually what's driving the business and um, uh, maybe a trip in the future would be worthwhile for some of our investors to see as well. Um, later today, we've got Chris Way and the team here, and later today he'll take you through some of the propositions. We'll bring it to life. Um, we're going to be a little bit judicious. What we say is some of the stuff is uh, not market sensitive, but certainly commercially sensitive. Um, but again, have a look. Tell us what you think. Now, this slide here, composites win in a digital world. Over the past 10 years or so, undoubtedly the best performers in the insurance sector 
have a look at the prices, have been, have a look at the multiples, have been specialists and monolines, single country monolines. That's just a fact. My thesis is we are now entering a period of generational change. I believe the next decade will be the decade where composites come to the fore. Now, digital is the key catalyst for this, but there's also scale, uh, which is more necessary than ever, regulation, brand disintermediation, and the right, and also balance of product mix and big data. They're also key ingredients. So why do I believe in the thesis? Well, in the digital world, particularly where we have a disinterme disintermediated world, and our industry is not immune, we have large composite insurance with strong brands that have four key structural advantages you can see on the slide here. The first of those is more data. If you're a monoline or single country, you just do not have that. But it's not just more data, it's better data. It's the ability to cross-analyze the data between product categories and underwriting. This gives us a major advantage in how we price risk. You'll see some of that today. We don't have to ask questions of customers over and over again. This reduces what we call the repellent factor for customers, many of whom, in fact most of whom, I expect customers in the room, detest the inquisition each time they want to buy a product. That's the whole reason that intermediaries have been forced into the equation. And it allows us to target customers and effectively underwrite them at really good margins much more effectively. That's the first benefit of a composite. The second one is lower cost. We don't have to spend a fortune on acquiring the customer. And what we do is spread the cost across a greater number of customers. Now, by the way, digital also helps the broker journey and other journeys, because we can still make that simpler and cheaper as well. So it applies actually to all channels. And like just a few of our peers, not too many, but a few, digital is allowing us to improve efficiency in settling claims and administering the policies and serving the customers. And this is something our UK insurance team is already doing very effectively. Um, part of the big part of the composite, uh, since we put those businesses together, and I've done a few trips in the last month, I was surprised at how quickly they've taken it on. And Andy, I guess maybe I'll talk about that throughout today a bit. The third thing, it's more capital efficient by a big margin. The fact is Solvency 2 was a game changer and it's one of the reasons we've picked up market share in places like the UK and France and, and Italy and others. Solvency 2 was a game changer. It enshrined into regulation what we already knew and that is that insurance is about diversification. It's fundamentally about spreading the risk. And finally, Solvency 2 recognised that, and that helped us. It gives us a more effective balance sheet. For the first time, with the introduction of Solvency 2, diversification is locked into those capital standards. And it give us, gives us a significant pricing benefit over the monolines or over single country insurance companies. And it makes sense. We only have one monoline of scale, and that's actually Canada, and the fact is, that's our most volatile business. Interesting, isn't it? So we want to be composite. The fourth thing is deeper relationships. Across the composites, but particularly in life and savings, there's an element of trust in the relationship. The lower you are down the trust curve, it's more like motor insurance, it's more of a transactional arrangement. The higher up that trust curve, it's a longer term relationship. Um, and the more products you can sell, the fact is they stay longer, and it's basically um, less of a commodity trade, uh, and our research shows that clearly. As a result, composites in a disintermediated world are uniquely positioned to serve more of the customer needs, which leads in turn to them staying longer, and leads in turn to much higher margins. One of the biggest factors in margins is the retention. That is very clear. You know, the fact is that the composite model works well for customers. It's simpler, it's quicker, it's easier and cheaper. It works well for us. And you know, with our digital uh, brand and balance sheet, uh, we're pretty well positioned. So it's interesting, seeing some of the recent investor days hosted by our peers, and we had a look at them all, I'm sure some of them have a look at us today. 
Um, there seems to be alignment across the composite sector in terms of the strategic priorities. Improved focus, so less countries, if you said that. Customer centricity, innovation technology, pretty similar. These are all words you have heard repeatedly in recent weeks. And they're right. We certainly agree with this. Aviva is moving in a similar direction, and we started the same journey four years ago. Yeah, we've already trimmed down our business. We've already got to the uh, countries we want. We started that digital journey. We got our systems together. We have a f improved focus in fewer countries. But I believe that Composite's a best place to deliver all the stuff we're talking about, and I think we will out-compete the mono lines over the coming decade by a significant margin. Now, different composites are not in the same markets. It's an important point. They don't have the same balance sheets. They don't have the same risk. They don't have the same guarantees. We don't even have the same products, not even close. And it's fair to say we're in different stages of our journey. Some are in the fixed phase, some are in the trim down phase. Um, we're in we just are in different phases. So ultimately the question is, who will be the winners? Which one or two composites will win? Which one or two can execute the digital? Which one or two, it might even be one, might be none, uh, will have the right focus? Which ones have the courage to actually diversify their distribution and separate off digital? Now the answer to that question certainly isn't mine, that's for you and your investors to decide. And that crew, those questions I'll leave to you. Now, over the past 12 months, <coughs> we have delivered tangible results on our strategic capital allocation. We've withdrawn capital from Spain, we've out announced disposals of Friends Provident International in Taiwan, we've exited some bank insurance relationships because we thought you know, some of them were too expensive in JVs in France and Italy. And we've taken, we've taken out the businesses that were a drag on our growth. Spain we exited, we have the uh, ex-Spanish CEO here, because we realised we couldn't achieve our growth targets in Spain. It was that simple. He came to me and said, you know, we can get 2 or 3% growth, maybe a bit more. And we said, that's not enough. If you can't get that, we'll exit you. So we did. Now, what we have now is a streamlined, simpler group of businesses with competitive franchises, faster growth, and far better earnings quality. I'm happy with the perimeter. For now, I'll say for now, though, we are done pruning the apple trees. But as a management team, as you'd expect, we will, this will be continually reassessed. Because that's the nature of the group. That's the way we operate. It's about the numbers. Now, there's a, still a couple of small tendrils that we are um, going to tie up, uh, but we're now left with just two categories. We have the oaks and the acorns. We have eight oaks, which are the major markets. These are businesses that contribute a significant portion of our operating profit and cash today. And it's these businesses that will drive the majority of the operating profit growth in the next couple of years. Then we also have eight acorns, which are the strategic investments for the future. Now across these acorn markets, we are exposed to some large populations, low penetration, growing economies, and importantly, we have strong partners that will give us plenty of business potential there. And of course, we have digital that you'll see today, and digital is the icing on the cake. That is the potential to really turbocharge the growth. Now, one of the most common questions we get from investors is how will you grow? So we're giving you a bit more detail on that today, and this slide is an important slide. Let me start by saying, from the businesses we have left, this is an important fact, from the businesses we have left, we already have a pretty decent track record. Just look at the numbers. Though I do accept that this was a bit hard to see before because it was shrouded in noise. Well, not anymore. Over the last three years, we've grown operating EPS by 5% CAGR. Just to be clear, over the last three years, we've grown operating EPS by 5% CAGR. And this is no mean feat in a 
tricky environment but we also have been in the middle of restructuring and de-risking. We also had to contend with Brexit, low interest rates and economic, challenging economic growth in some of the markets, some of our larger markets. But despite all this and despite all these headwinds, so there's no excuses, we have still managed to grow by 5% CAGR. Now, I wouldn't say universally because we didn't want to grow in some segments or some markets, but in all of our target areas where we wanted to grow, we've done that and more. And we've been intensely focused on margins. We've been intensely focused in terms of GI underwriting and operating expenses. So what about the future? Well, the assumed wisdom, I guess that's why you have a market, but the assumed wisdom is that to grow you need to be concentrated in emerging markets. But ladies and gentlemen, I believe that is the old paradigm. That was so 15 years ago. For, for example, growth rates in Europe now are outstripping growth rates in parts of Asia, like Hong Kong and Singapore. Just as an example. And I think we need to focus on market by market and uh, stop this generalist approach of saying a region equals growth. It does not. Markets equal growth. And just because a market is well developed or well penetrated or vice versa, does not mean that it is X growth. That's a naive and outdated assumption, particularly in the digital world. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that all our markets are going to sustainably grow at many multiples of GDP. Some will, others won't. But with the markets that we have left, and we chose them specifically, like the UK, there are new and expanding profit pools that we are extraordinarily well positioned to tap into. And unlike emerging markets, and this is important, there is now far less competition in a market like the UK. There's fewer players to compete with and getting fewer. We have the biggest brand and we can grow and that's exactly what we've been doing. Our most recent results in the UK demonstrate that we have been able to do just that. And I can tell you that trend has continued. Across each of the four major product lines that you see on the slide here, we have in fact delivered double digit growth and operating profit. We've delivered significant improvements in market share. We've delivered significant improvements in top line as well over the past 18 months. Since we got our act together and since we've pulled the businesses together in UKI, it's certainly accelerated. And in a funny way, I think Brexit's actually helped us because people have gravitated towards the big brands. And with the expanding asset pools and the long-term savings, which you can see on the top of that slide there, this has got enormous potential, enormous opportunity in there and the annuities market. And we've got our continued implementation of digital and composite strategies. That's right across all the customer groups. We're seeing that particularly in the corporate business this year. Um, which was earlier than we expected. So we've got plenty of confidence in the growth outlook. If you disagree, I suggest you have a chat to Andy at the break. But it's not just a UK growth story. It's just not. Because the fact is that we've got 42% of our operating earnings, our earnings are outside UK insurance. So we're nicely what I call balanced for Brexit. In fact, if you want a safe ship in the Brexit storm, then I would suggest we may be just that. We have the balance sheet, we have the brand, we are the safe ship in our Brexit storm, and we've got 42% of our earnings outside the UK, which is a lovely hedge. Across our international business, we have um, positions of strength. And uh, you can see that um, in the slide, the next slide. Hopefully you can see that in the next slide. I can. Um, and uh, we're delivering growth and margins in these respective markets as well. It's one of the reasons we're in Poland. Um, in life, we're growing volumes and net flows, but we're also continually improving the mix of business. We're increasing the contribution of fee and protection business. Just like in the UK, our strategy is capital light. And that's an important point. It's part of our success in generating so much capital off our balance sheet. 
Um, in GI, we're growing premiums while maintaining a pretty attractive combined ratio. In Asia, Singapore is getting real traction with the FA model as the traditional agency model dies. Uh, we're positioned pretty well then. Of course, Aviva Investors is delivering some pretty good performance and we've targeted continued strong double digit growth from them for the foreseeable future. Ewan's nodding his head, that's good. So, very strong double digit growth. Um, so look, I'm not saying growth is easy to come by. Uh, growth is never easy to come by, but I am saying that the franchises we have left have a pretty decent track record and we see plenty of opportunities to grow and we're moving into a new phase and we have the capital to be able to do it. My team and I now spend far more time on innovation and growth than we do on the fix, because the fix is done. And what is perhaps difficult for you all to see externally is in the change in the mindset and the approach of each of our teams, because we've just shifted that emphasis. It's what we talk about. I don't mean growth in top line, that comes as a result in it. I mean growth in bottom line and growth in profitable revenues, and it's a fundamentally different thing. Now, Morris and the team will take you through more detail on the international businesses throughout today's event, and I think that will help to illuminate this point. So what about digital? <clears throat> Insurance is one of the last frontiers for digital disruption. It's interesting, isn't it? And there's a few reasons why it has taken much longer than other industries. Capital intensity, which most startups, even large tech firms, can't do. Uh, regulatory inter interaction, even simple firms like taxis in the UK are finding the regulators a little bit more difficult now. It's a whole lot more difficult in insurance. Um, supply chain management complexity, claims, the cost of customer acquisition, of course the fact that unlike say banking, it is much harder to disaggregate the value chain. That's why composites well, are well positioned. But digital is inevitable, and just like insur uh, for insurance, and just like it has been in all other industries. Now, our leadership role in terms of digital in the industry is a function of our intellectual property, of our IP. And we've made some progress in critical areas. We will show you that in the sessions this afternoon. We have all of our customer systems talking to each other. That is quite a feat. Um, we didn't understand how complex that plumbing was. I'll come back to that. As a result, we now have a single view of the customer across all their product holdings. It's convenient for the customer, it's helping to improve the cost, sell and retention, and allows us to improve efficiency and service quality. And all of these pieces of tech and our infrastructure, it's all sort of coming together at once and it's starting to snowball, and for the first time we have proof points. We have developed something called Ask It Never, which uses our proprietary and publicly available data to underwrite and price products without asking customers any questions, or very few. This fundamentally changes the customer experience, you're going to see it today, and removes one of the biggest barriers that have historically discouraged customers from consolidating their insurance with a single supplier and it stopped them going direct. And we believe, and our pilot testing adds a whole lot of confidence to this, that we can develop a self-reinforcing cycle where bet more service and convenience, not asking questions, plus better value for money, plus uh, entanglement tools, which you'll see a bit of today, massively improves customer intention and increases product take up and the ultimate improvement in product and margin and pricing power. It just all sort of comes together. And we can further strengthen our customer expedition and attention through initiatives like our digital wallet, putting payments on our digital wallet so we control the transaction flow. And that's many, many, many billions of pounds per annum. And um, more about that at a later date. Importantly, this is not just a play on direct to consumer front end. As you have seen with some of our recent announcements, our digital IP is also making us the partner of choice. You can see on the slide, world class partnerships. Now this one surprised us, or well, it certainly surprised me. Some of my team will say well, it didn't surprise me, well it did me. Um, I think the underlying systems on the consumer side took longer than I thought, and they were more expensive. And it took us years to do the underlying plumbing, or take us years to actually finish it, frankly. 
But the partnerships, on the other hand, were much quicker than we anticipated. Now, we've expanded you know, some pretty big deals, our relationship with HSBC. They tell us it was because of our IP. What about 10 cents? They went into that because of our IP. What about RBC, which is a pretty big relationship? Again, a major part of that was our IP. We had their board and their senior management come and see our digital garage for a couple of days last week. Um, they said they'd never seen anything like it. It's our IP. And so we've had, you're saying, where are we getting it? Well, actually the quickest uh, outcome was through our partnerships, which probably surprised us all. These are all examples where the IP and not the price. We don't pay big up some amounts of money for digital through banking relationships. That is old. We get those relationships because of OIP. That is the new world, ladies and gentlemen. And I might add, what can I say? Again, off script. Um, we have a number of pretty good ongoing discussions with some other large partners. More of that later, but not today. Um, now, there's for the past few years, our focus has been on building IP. It's been on connecting all the plumbing together. And the individual parts are now starting to come together. We're systematically turning on the taps of our, of our individual customer groups. And you'll see much more of this in the market over the next few months. We do what we call sprints. Uh, so every six weeks, we've got major releases of functionality. And this just happens now continually every six weeks. I think of four years ago, it would happen every uh, six months. And um, now we've just fundamentally changed the way our IT works. OK, so you see all that today as well. Now, what about capital and cash, or more specifically, excess capital and excess cash? Now, it's not exactly new news that we have capital in excess of our desired range. Um, but the size of it, I think, will surprise you a bit. And today, we're going to be a bit more specific. Um, at our 2016 Capital Markets Day, it seems more recent than that. Um, what was it? It was about July last year, wasn't it? I think someone was telling me last night. So uh, we probably maybe should have had one a little bit earlier. Um, at our 2016 Capital Markets Day, we announced a target of 7 billion of remittances. Um, I know quite a few people thought that was uh, around the room, probably thought there was going to be a bit of a stretch. Well, today, the remittance figure is going to be 8 billion. Uh, this is partly due to proceeds from disposals, uh, but it's actually mainly due to some better than we expected capital generation, which seems to be continuing. Uh, that's partly because we were selling more capital light products, uh, we repriced products, we were able to cross sell products more effectively than we thought, and we just also got to understand Solvency 2 better. So every time we look at it, the capital generation just seems to be coming along nicely. As a result of this, we expect to have a total cash pile at the group centre to deploy of three billion over the next couple of years. That's of deployable capital above, you know, well above the range of three billion in the next two years with two billion pounds in 2018 alone, and I'll choose my words carefully, and at least one billion pounds, at least one in 2019. So what are our plans for deployment in 2018? We plan to use 900 million, I'm very specific in that number, to pay down some very expensive debt. This is a no brainer. Now, to be clear, to be really clear, I am comfortable with our current level of debt. And I fundamentally disagree with any analysis that suggests that we have a peer group for debt for any comparison. Because any comparison must be risk adjusted, and we clearly have the lowest guarantees. We don't have the same risk on our balance sheet. We have the most stable balance sheet. So how can you compare levels of debt? And given we recently got upgraded to AA by Moody's, there is now some strong external vindication of this view. But nevertheless, we are still paying down 900 million of debt. So I guess that takes that issue off the table. 
But importantly, and the main reason to be frank, is this will save us a huge amount in terms of cash paid out each and every year in, in interest expense from the group. The, okay, so if you put it all together, it's over 100 million, actually. Uh, the remaining 1.1 billion of the 2 billion, that's next year alone, because you've got more the following year, just to be clear, uh, will be split between bolt-on M&A and capital returns. We do have an appetite for M&A. We just did, uh, what was it, 140 million? Was it? 130. Uh, 130 in Ireland a few weeks ago, you saw that. We do have an appetite for M&A, for Bolton M&A. You should not expect the entire 1.1 billion to be returned in the next uh, year, in 2018, or indeed the entire 2 billion to be returned over the next two years. Um, obviously, you have the debt on top of that as well, but you should not expect the entire two billion. We do have an appetite for some M&A, and we will continue to look for attractive deals that will strengthen our franchises and, importantly, be accretive to growth. That's it, that word there again. And given we have pruned, we've done a fair bit of pruning, given we have pruned our lower quality earnings, some M&A is a very legitimate way to assist growth and we are extraordinarily good at it. Every sale we have done and every acquisition we have done in the past five years has exceeded to you what we said it would. I think that gives us a little bit of headroom to do some amount of M&A. But we do expect, I'll be very clear on this one too, we do expect capital returns to form a material part of the deployment strategy as we progress through 2018 and 19. And if you listen closely to Tom's presentation, he may provide you some more numbers. And given we, um, deploying that surplus capital will naturally be accretive to growth, but it is not just the quantum of earnings that we have improved, it is also the quality of earnings. And I accept that histo histo historically our quality in some areas was more suspect. But now the businesses we have left, our core franchises, and this slide's important, are delivering strong earnings and delivering strong capital generation. This in turn leads to higher levels of sustainable cash flow and one reason to focus on capital light, which uses less capital, it's generated higher capital than we had expected. So the quality of the earnings, just a normal growth uh, is, is key. You don't actually see that on the slide, but I'll just, you can add that to the slide when you think about it. Now we're also improving the earnings quality by exiting the businesses with low growth prospects or businesses that didn't contribute cash up to the group. A pretty good example of that was uh, the FPI uh, disposal. So the FBI disposal you know, contributed to us in terms of operation earnings, but didn't contribute one pound up to the group, so it was low quality earnings. And I know some of you were worried about losing earnings, but you know, it's, uh, it's simple that it wasn't contributing to us. Um, we're using the proceeds on the debt, you can see on that part there, you can using the proceeds to reduce high cost debt and strengthen our business, and so that also at the group level adds to the quality of the earnings because it's all cash. And then the first bar there, we simply, because we've finished the friends uh, life into, uh, integration and we now have much lower integration restructuring costs, again, improving the very cash conversion, the quality of earnings to the group. So the reduction in debt I should have added also improves quality of earnings by over 100 million pounds. So what does all this mean? Operating profit turns into net income. Net income turned into cash at a much higher proportion. Cash at group. So better quality earnings, higher cash conversion. So we are upgrading our dividend payout. It's pretty simple maths. This makes our dividend payout affordable. And so what we've done, uh, we spoke to the board and it's very appropriate that we progressively increase our payout ratio to 55 to 60 percent of operating EPS by 2020. And ladies and gentlemen, if you look at the facts, we've grown dividends by double digit in each of the last three years, 
and it looks like that sort of growth will continue for quite a while longer. I think that is appropriate given the quality of earnings increase. Right, so let's bring it all together. At this event last year, we outlined three expectations. Today, we are reaffirming, we're updating, and we're upgrading those expectations. On cash remittances, upgrading that to 8 billion, and this gives us a very large pile of cash, 3 billion to be exact, allowing us to reduce debt and improve growth. And on our dividend payout ratio target has also been increased to 55 to 60 percent, a consequence of the improvement in earnings quality. This means our dividend should continue to grow strongly. I don't think it's much more complicated than that. And so that is, ladies and gentlemen, cash flow plus growth upgraded. Uh, we will have Q&A a later. But for now, I'll hand you over to uh, Mr. Tom Stoddart. Very good. Thank you, Mark. Okay. As you'll have noted already, we're doing a bit of everything. Growing earnings, increasing the dividend target, returning capital, and seeking both on acquisitions. The point of my presentation is to help simplify this mix for you and to give you a better sense of our priorities. So to be clear, I want you to take away three messages. First, I'll remind you that our balance sheet is strong and getting stronger. Second, I'll outline how our business unit profitability turns into capital and cash flow and fuels a growing dividend. And third, I'll, I'll talk about how we plan to redeploy about 3 billion pounds of excess liquidity over the next two years. So big picture, we're getting stronger across the board. Our number one priority is to deliver growth. We've improved our quality of earnings by focusing on a narrower set of businesses, and we'll keep improving them by reducing integration and restructuring costs to a minimal amount next year. As you know, we've worked hard to rebuild the balance sheet, and so we'll continue to maintain strong capital and liquidity, but we will also redeploy some of it to grow earnings consistent with the growth opportunities Mark outlined for you just a moment ago. And of course, we're trying to make the dividend sacrosanct while increasing it in line with our business performance. Aviva's investment thesis remains cash flow plus growth. So my remarks today will focus on the sources of that cash flow and growth, which primarily means the middle part of this page, the green box with the oaks. The acorns are important to us as well, but they're bets on the future. They give us extra growth options on top of our current eight major markets, and we'll manage them for option value over time. And more important today, as you can see in the green box, is that we have a diverse portfolio of oaks across our eight major markets, consisting of the UK, France, Canada, Aviva Investors, Poland, Italy, Singapore, and Ireland. In each of these markets, we're seeking scale positions where we own 100% or close to it of the enterprise and can pursue a true customer composite and digital first strategy. Today, these markets are our sources of consistent earnings growth and cash flow. Now, I'm going to focus for a moment on our two biggest oaks, first the UK and then France. You need to understand that the financial outcomes and increased targets we are talking about today are being driven by improvements in our underlying businesses starting in the UK. We have a very strong UK franchise and created a unique operating model combining life, GI, and health insurance into a single, very large, and very powerful business. We've been exceeding our targets for UK insurance, and as a result of hard work and smart risk management, we now expect to exceed our cash remittance targets from this business by about a billion pounds. We're ahead of the game in optimizing for Solvency II and are succeeding in making this a capital-like business. We had double-digit growth across all go-to-market segments in 2016 and again at the half-year 2017 and believe we can keep growing without a lot of capital strain. Now, that's an important underpin for our decision to target a higher dividend payout ratio. We also see attractive market opportunities to expand, particularly across our corporate business, by leveraging our brand strength and TCC and digital capabilities. Pension pools are just one example of where we can be opportunistic, as we've seen with some of the sharp increases in sales volumes this year. Finally, I need to point out that, as we've said in the past, our back books can be a source of value from time to time. Longevity trends appear to be favorable against our 50 billion pound annuity portfolio, so even while we maintain what we believe to be a prudent position, 
relative to industry benchmarks, we may have relatively significant reserve releases this year and perhaps again in 2018 unless trends reverse. And moving over to France, we're also feeling more positive about this market as well. And since it's the second largest contributor to the group, this is meaningful. Back at the end of 2016, we were concerned with progress on expenses and capital optimization in France, so we put in new management. The positive change since then is palpable in the spirit and feeling evident in the business today. And Patrick will talk later about what he and his team are doing to pursue growth. From a financial perspective, we're now making better progress in France, especially in terms of capital management. We now expect the Dynamic Volatility Adjuster, DVA, to be approved for use locally in France, although that benefit would be uh, reversed out in our consolidated group model, which is governed in the UK and where we cannot take credit for the DVA. So nevertheless, having DVA in France would enhance the stability of our capital position there and support center liquidity. And not having it at the group level is just another source of prudence in our Solvency II position. For 2018, we're also working on a new French Supplementary Pension Fund, FRPS, which will provide better risk management and benefit local capital. Finally, I should note that France has been a source of slightly higher interest rate sensitivity for the group, especially in a very low rate environment. So we've been watching this closely and taking steps to limit it further. The bottom line is that we have much more confidence today in the dividend paying capacity of our French business than we did a year ago. So with our two biggest engines in the UK and France humming along, let me come back to the overall earnings outlook. To put this in perspective, please bear in mind that we've had to do a lot of cleaning up and cleaning out in the process of turning Aviva around. The hard work is done, but the payoff is still to come. So as you can see from the chart, 2018 will still be a bit of a transition year for us, and we should begin hitting full stride in 2019. Now, I think a lot of you like to focus on the headwind store performance, so let me start there and talk to you about what I see. First, we have perimeter changes in the aftermath of divesting businesses such as FPI, Spain, and Antarius. So while our quality of earnings and growth potential goes up from a more focused footprint, there's nonetheless some foregone operating profit, and we'll address that partly through capital management. The next biggest drag is Canada, where the market's having a tough year. We're taking rate and other actions and still consider this to be a very good business, but it's not flying as high today as it has in the past. And I also need to budget for significant change spend over the next couple of years, some of which I'm very happy to do, such as investing in our digital and IT capabilities, and some of which, for example, IFRS 17, promise more, shall we say, elusive potential benefits. Now, some of this spend will show up in the corporate line, so don't be surprised if you see that increase. At the same time, we continue to drive efficiencies across the business and are reallocating resources to invest in growth. Which takes me to the tailwinds listed on the slide. First, we're expecting our major markets to keep delivering organic growth in excess of 5% per year, and in the cases of Aviva investors, Poland and Singapore, higher still. We will also benefit from continued asset re-risking in our UK annuity business, and as I mentioned before, we may have some significant contribution from longevity in the back book. These contributions may only be short-term temporary factors, but they will help finance and pay for the change spend noted in the headwinds. We're also benefiting from foreign exchange impacts in our non-UK earnings in 2017. And finally, we have capital management, including share buybacks and acquisitions, which should be EPS accretive and help us to deliver as per past guidance. Accordingly, we're maintaining the target of mid-single-digit growth and operating earnings per share for 2017 and 2018, and targeting growth above 5% beginning 2019. But I know you're all wondering how to convert profits into capital and cash flow. Unfortunately, there's not a straight line from one to the other, nor does Solvency II accounting make it easy to predict future growth. And all the optimization work we've been doing, part sevens, model changes and such, doesn't make it any easier to follow. So we spent some time trying to strip out capital actions and look at underlying run rates implicit in our plans on a more normalized basis. From that analysis, we worked out the recipe you see on this slide. This is not an exact science, but should provide a pretty good rule of thumb to compare us on future results. Now, based on our existing business mix, we would generally expect to convert about 80%, give or take, of our after-tax, after-minority interest, IFRS operating profit at the business unit level, um, into surplus ge capital generation, or OCG. And it's a higher ratio for GI business, but UK life is a little bit lower because of annuities. 
Now, around 90% or more of underlying business unit OCG should convert to cash remittances paid up to the center. We have some financing and other costs to pay at the center, which we'll be reducing as we pay down debt, with the rest of the cash flow ample to cover the external dividend to shareholders. Much of our business, especially on the life side, is self-funding on a Solvency II basis, so we don't need to retain a lot of OCG in order to support growth of 5% or better. Now, in a steady state, OCG and financing costs, including the cash dividend payable to shareholders, should offset and the Solvency II cover ratio be stable. But we're not in a steady state yet. In fact, we're doing better than that. Over the course of 2016, 17, 18, and 19, we have had and will have significant other capital actions on top of the underlying result, which enhance our capital position overall, but distort the simple picture I've painted on this slide. Typically, we might get a big model change approved late in the year and then need to convert that into liquidity and a cash remittance from the subsidiary in a following year. This is one of the reasons why we're now building up excess liquidity for redeployment over the next couple of years. Our pipeline of capital actions is also one of the reasons why I expect that our Solvency II cover ratio will tend to trend up above 200%, all else equal, over the next year and possibly longer. At some point, it should stabilize, but our OCG has been exceeding our dividend and capital return, so we will have to work actively to convert it into cash and redeploy it through acquisitions or additional capital returns. But coming back to the slide and ignoring the other capital actions, you should be able to take further comfort in our sustainability of the dividend and our ability to grow it over time. Nevertheless, some of you may still be wondering why we're increasing the payout ratio target. Well, three simple reasons. First, our underlying business, particularly in UK insurance, is outperforming our prior plans. It's ahead on becoming a capital light business, and that alone justifies a higher payout. Second, our quality of earnings has improved. As you can see from the chart on the left, we're eliminating the cash drain of paying integration and restructuring costs below the line. Now, if you deducted these from operating EPS as if they were dividends, our effective payout ratio would already have been above 50%. So as we save this cash, we're better positioned to deliver it to shareholders instead. And we focus the business and divested cash poor FPIL earnings. Third, we expect to save over 100 million pounds of debt interest costs so we can add this amount to the amount we pay shareholders. That makes us happier, frankly. So we intend to keep the dividend growing as the business grows and enhance it further, grading up toward a 55 to 60% payout ratio by 2020. Now moving on to the balance sheet, and I'll go a little bit faster through these final few slides. This is just a reminder. We've been on an improving trend on ratings and welcome the Moody's upgrade to AA last month as recognition of the hard work that we've done. We've returned an extra 800 million pounds to investors this year and still our Solvency II cover ratio grows. Now this next slide is another reminder that our capital position is resilient to stress. We are tightly matched and have a high quality investment portfolio. If we were, to hit, if we were hit today with another crisis like the 2008 global financial crisis, or the 2011 sovereign debt crisis, we would still be in a solid surplus capital position. Also recall that right after the Brexit vote, we set aside an extra 300 million pounds for commercial and residential property exposures, so we've done the prudent thing there. This effectively captured about a 10% one-time fall in property prices. If anything, property price indices have held up better than this, but we're happy to leave this prudence in place for now. Any way you look at it, we're resilient to a whole range of stresses. Now, I think our capital investment risk teams rate up there as good or better than any in the industry. Over the last five years, we've created plenty of capital while cleaning up the balance sheet and protecting against potential stresses. We've exited the wrong kinds of exposures, such as problem commercial mortgages and latent GI risks, while putting ourselves in a position to grow both organically and inorganically. Our hedging and investing activities served us well. So as a result, our center liquidity is growing significantly. As you can see here, before redeployment, liquid assets at the center would have trended up to over 4 billion pounds over the next two years. We returned 800 million in 2017 and expect to redeploy another 2 billion or so in 2018 with more to follow in 2019. From a risk management perspective, we try to maintain at least 1 billion at the center at all times, and we calculate a two-year forward look at ins and outs under a stress scenario to make sure that we carry sufficient liquidity. 
So the question is, what are we going to do with the cash? Well, flipping to the next slide, you can see that our current expectation is that we would repay without refinancing the two tranches of hybrid debt available for first call in 2018. This totals 900 million. I'd also expect at least 500 million of additional capital returns, either through liability management or share repurchase activity. And we could do both. The swing factor is M&A. We don't depend on it, but certainly would like to find more bolt-on acquisitions, such as Friends First in Ireland and RBC General in Canada. Our focus for M&A is in our eight major markets, and our appetite has increased. But if we don't make acquisitions, we will have more to return to investors. In 2019, I'd expect more of the same. We're being a little less specific the further out in time we look, but the thought process is very similar. We prioritize steady growth in the dividend first. We repeatedly look to reduce the cost of our debt, and we take a disciplined approach to evaluating acquisitions choosing to return capital to shareholders unless we find deals that, one, fit strategically, two, are more financially attractive, and three, we can execute well. Now, before I close, let me try to preempt one of your questions. The answer is no. I don't think our capital redeployment over the next two years will get us to 165% Solvency II cover ratio. Matter of fact, I don't even think it will take us below 180%, the top end of our working range. We'll have even more work to do on investment or reallocation to get there, and we're working on it. In the meantime, our cover ratio is trending higher. So that brings me back to our expectations and ends my messages with Aviva aiming higher on EPS growth, delivering more cash, and boosting the dividend payout ratio. Thank you. Mars, over to you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, good morning, everyone. You know, at our last Capital Markets Day presentation, I stood in front of you as chairman of Global General Insurance for Aviva. Since then, Aviva has strengthened our international focus, bringing together operations in France, Canada, Poland, Italy, Ireland, and Turkey. And it's my pleasure to stand here today as CEO of Aviva's international businesses. Today, I want my presentation to answer the following three questions. Why does Aviva's international footprint look the way it does? What is our competitive advantage in each of these markets? And how will we exceed Group's target of mid-single-digit growth? Think of my session as an introduction into high-quality international franchises. And you know what? Later this morning, you'll have a chance to deep dive in Canada, France, and Poland with our market CEOs are here today. So why am I so confident about growth in these markets? Well, first, we've significantly reduced, as Mark said, the number of markets we operate in, and our footprint, I believe, is now compelling. We have 13 million customers and access to 300 million people. Our businesses provide exposure to some of the world's largest insurance markets. They are a mix of attractive business units that offer both cash flow and growth, and emerging markets such as Poland and Turkey. Secondly, we have recent macroeconomic tailwinds in a number of our markets, such as a pro-business reform agenda in France, high economic growth rates in Ireland, Poland, and Turkey, the easing of a banking crisis in Italy. Thirdly, we have some first-class distribution and partners. This is one of the areas where I think people underestimate the Aviva International story. We have unique competitive advantages designed to win in each of our chosen markets. Let me come back to this later. And ultimately, they are all tasked with the same objective of delivering controlled, calculated, and well-managed growth. So let me highlight the relevance and size of international businesses excluding Asia. 1.3 billion pounds of operating profit was generated from international businesses. This represents 36% of the group's total. Life fee and B is a third of the group's total. Over half of the group's general insurance premiums sit outside the UK, diversifying our GI business. The split is weighted heavily in favor of Canada, which represents 30% of the group's net written premiums, having grown nicely since the acquisition of RBC 
in 2016. From a capital and cash perspective, the international business is over a third of group. And recent modeling changes, which Tom alluded to in France, have allowed us to reduce the volatility in the capital position and improve the solvency ratio. I expect dividends to increase consistently over time. You know, at Aviva, we focus on capital allocation, not shrinking, deploying resources only in markets and segments where we believe we can win. And occasionally, we choose to hold back dividends, just as we did in Canada with the acquisition of RBC, a deal which has proven to be excellent. These figures show that international is a very important contributor to the group's overall growth ambitions. Let me tell you a bit about our markets, and specifically why I'm excited about their prospects. France is the fifth largest insurance market in the world. I think we can all agree that the agenda of the new government is positive for business too. We have a world-class diversified distribution with leadership positions in five distribution channels. We have the fourth largest agent network with almost a thousand tied agents and are one of only two players that continue to grow their agent network. We have the number two direct player in the market with Eurofill. The direct market in France continues to grow attractively. We also own UFF, the leading wealth management network. In France, our competitive advantage is clearly our own and diversified distribution. However, our challenge is to optimize these assets to fuel further growth. And I'm very excited about Patrick's plans, and he'll tell you more later this morning. Canada. Canada is the eighth largest insurance market in the world and benefits from a stable economy and political system. You know, over the past decade, our Canadian business has outperformed the market by being a leader in pricing, underwriting, and indemnity management all competitive advantages for our business. It has consistently been one of the better performers in the Aviva Group. Now, as Tom alluded to, 2017 has been a difficult year for the Canadian market and for Aviva Canada. We've seen increased frequency in the motor line, an increase in NatCat losses above a long-term average, from floods to wildfires to windstorms, and most notably, the elimination of favorable development. Our response to 2017 is multi-pronged and underway, and you'll hear more from Greg on those details later today. I should add, however, that the integration of RBC was textbook. We've grown the written premiums by 25% at the half year, and we expect to continue to outperform the market in the future. Poland. It's easy to be positive about Poland, and not just because we're here on this snowy day. As we heard last evening, the economy is growing strongly. We are nearing full employment, and insurance penetration is still relatively low. Hopefully over the course of the day, you'll get a real sense of the ambition that we have here in this market. We are a composite player. We have strong positions in each segment. We're the second largest life insurance provider, a leading protection player, and have a growing GI business. And we benefit from a highly recognized brand in this important market. Our competitive advantage is being technically sound at insurance. We have one of the lowest cost income ratios in the market, and consequently, some of the strongest returns in Aviva with ROEs consistently in the mid 30s. The business has enjoyed a strong track record of growth, being one of the most advanced in Europe on its digital agenda, and having recently announced a new bank assurance deal with ING, Aviva Poland is set for future growth. I'll let Adam share some of the excitement of his plans with you later today. <coughs> Italy, seventh largest insurance market in the world. This is also a market where the asset flows are extremely positive, perhaps arguably the best in the Europe at the, at the moment. And we've seen net inflows north of two billion pounds. We've grown strongly in this market in the past 12 months. In fact, our market position has improved from 12th the seventh in those past seven, 12 months. We are a composite player with life, general insurance, and an asset management business. Our unique competitive advantage has been, a pro has been product innovation and leveraging liability management skills from the group. The distribution model at the moment is dominated by bank assurance partnerships in the life business, 
and by a large multi-agent network in general insurance. We started to diversify our model and have grown through the IFA channel, notably through Finico over the past 12 months. Turkey. Turkey is an emerging market. We like the demographics of the market, the population of 80 million people with half of those being under the age of 30. We've seen rapid growth in Turkey and have a tremendous partner in the Sabanchi Group. The market is changing rapidly and we are well placed to capitalize. The market cap of our Turkish business currently stands at $600 million. We make no secret about our ambition for this to be a $2 billion business. We have great digital capabilities. You know, when Turkey announced auto enrollment earlier this year, we were ready with a market leading platform, both in terms of functionality and cross sell capability. And lastly, but not least, Ireland. Ireland has some of the highest GDP growth rates in Europe. John Quinlan, our Irish CEO, is growing the business strongly. We announced 12% constant currency operating profit growth at half year 2017 to 42 million sterling and a record core of just under 85%. We also have high ambitions for the future and the prospects for continued growth are excellent. Our competitive advantages are our scale, our strong brand, our technical insurance skills, where we benefit from leveraging UKGI and also Canada. Growth prospects are even stronger now that we've just announced an attractive deal for the business Friends First. So let me talk a bit about Friends First. I think this acquisition epitomizes bolt-on M&A in Aviva. It is absolutely consistent with our smart deployment of capital to boost key markets. For consideration of 130 million euros, which is 0.8 times embedded value, we have 250,000 more customers and a market-leading group risk and protection offering. We will become the market-leading composite insurer with 1.1 million customers, roughly one in every five people in Ireland. We will maintain, of course, our number one position, which is growing handsomely in general insurance, and our ambition in life is to grow from number four today to number three. The deal will be accretive from year one and will significantly exceed our hurdle rates thereafter. Let me talk a little bit about our partnerships. You know, the success of our international business is built on diversified distribution and strong partnerships, which you can see on this slide. As CEO of the UK General Insurance previously, I built a strong pipeline of partnership opportunities from HomeServe to Carphone Warehouse or with the deal announced earlier this year with HSBC in the UK. And I am determined to do the same in this new role. Each of our markets adapts to find the best solution for its market with the customer at the forefront of what we do. You know, the best model for France with a strong proprietary distribution isn't the best model for Canada, which has a tremendous broker network and partnerships with RBC. Here in Poland, we have great partners in Santander and a new exciting partnership with ING, which we expect to grow strongly. Italy is a market where I want our new CEO, Nacho, to take time to develop his own thoughts around strategy. We have partnerships with two of the largest banks and the IFA channel is growing but the own channel is not yet fully developed. Ireland is a market that we've talked a lot about already, but with a brand recognition second only to Guinness, it's no surprise that our direct GI business is doing well. And in Turkey, the strength of the relationship with the Zabanchi Group bodes well for our future. You know, across markets, it's not just established financial services that we have strong relationships with. We also have arrangements with innovators and disruptors such as Tesla and Canada to provide insurance on new models which helps us understand how future trends can become future opportunities. And hopefully you'd agree that the breadth and strength of our own channels and distribution partners positions us favorably to capitalize on the growth prospects prevalent in our international markets. And our funnel of deals is strong, very strong. So stay tuned. You know, we've seen that international's relevant contributor to the group's results. We have a strong and experienced management team, a compelling footprint, 
great distribution assets and partners. And as you can see from our slide, the business already has a track record for growth, and I want to increase the pace. The numbers in the charts are in constant currency. Let me highlight a couple of figures for you. Our life v &B. France is obviously the largest contributor. Illy has recorded some tremendous growth in its life business, with VNB growing from 63 million in 2014 to 124 million two years later in 2016. And we did this by improving the quality of our products. We reduced the guarantees to close to zero and have a selection of high performing assets that we can use to back our products. On Poland, the life numbers have been impacted by regulatory changes, including the asset levy, but the returns remain spectacular. And in terms of net written premiums, our international markets have seen good growth. But I still believe there's more to go at. The GI business in Europe is working closely with Canada, the UK and Ireland, where we have world-class pricing, underwriting and data analytics skills. So our life in GI premiums are growing. It's all well and good. But you may be thinking, are we growing by increasing risk for Aviva? And how are we managing our reserves? I want to focus here on two markets where comments are often made about the nature of the life products sold and about the high level of guarantees. And as you can see from this slide, we've taken positive actions in both markets to review the guarantees being offered to customers. Patrick will spend more time on the product mix in France. So let me give a little bit of color for you on Italy. We've reviewed our products and adopted our offering, adapted our offering, I should say. Overall, we've reduced the average guarantees from 1.8% in 2014 to 0.8% in 2017. This is a trend I expect to continue. 98% of our business in Italy is now sold with no or a 0% guarantee. And notably, the hybrid product is selling very strongly through both our IFA and bank assurance network. The hybrid acts as one product with a combination of with profit, unit linked, and protection features, thereby reducing the risk and improving the profitability. Roughly 65% of our hybrid premiums are invested in unit linked funds. You know, in both France and Italy, we've been able to achieve the trick of reducing guarantees while broadly maintaining portfolio yield. This is exactly what we should be targeting to secure healthy margins and to continue to grow our profits. So let me sum up. I believe I've shown the collective strength of international businesses, but let me come back to my three opening questions. Aviva's footprint. We are now in selected markets, both large and emerging, where we have a competitive advantage and I believe we can win. I've spoken about the competitive advantages of our markets, but to sum this up, it's about strong underwriting. It's about technically sound pricing. It's about the power of distribution. It's about working with the UK and international colleagues to source skills that we don't have. We are focused on growing the top line profitability, acquiring new customers, increasing our multi-product holdings, and developing new partnerships. We have delivered sustainable profit growth and our major cash contributed to the group. I look forward to delivering my part of these upgraded targets. And I certainly believe we'll be able to deliver a growth higher than the mid single digit target. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, everyone. So we're going to move into question and answers. Uh, please, in the interest of, uh, of sharing, can we limit it to two questions per person? We do have plenty of time, so we will get around if there are things to follow up upon. So uh, any questions? I don't think you're going to reach your two targets or something. Uh, hi, Chris. Uh, it's Andy Hughes McCurry. Uh, I'm not sure the beach ball really works quite as well in Poland, to be honest. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> it's a snowball. Yeah. Oh, snowball. Snowball. It's a it's yellow snowball. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> You're a lucky day, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> A um, couple of questions on the on the M and A um, side of things, really. Um, so, if I've understood what you're saying correctly. Um, you don't think you have to pay up for bank insurance partnerships because you've got the sort of technology. Mm -hmm. So I don't. That doesn't sound like that's part of the M and A budget to buy distribution through bank insurance. 
Um, the, the second point you made was there's no huge increase in restructuring costs which also suggests that obviously if you did do bolt on M&A you would normally associate an increase in restructuring costs with the M&A. Um, what am I missing in the in the kind of how, how, does, how do you spend the M&A budget without increasing restructuring costs or spending on distribution? Because it sounds like you need to spend on distribution to get the growth in the core markets. Well, maybe answer just the first bit of that. So I think bank assurance agreements, uh, particularly in Asia, got totally out of control. And we signalled our intent with DBS. Looks like we made a pretty good decision. Um, we, uh, then we focused on RBC. So the RBC basically was a good deal for both parties. They're delighted with it. So are we. And remember, we basically bought their business at a fair price and got a, I think of it like getting a 15 year exclusive bank insurance deal being thrown in for nothing. That sounds like a good use of capital. Um, you're seeing HSBC, that deal was about tech. Now, I'm not saying we wouldn't pay anything. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't rule that out. But the sort of money that is being paid, particularly in Asia, I'm not interested. Fundamentally, because the new paradigm isn't about bank assurance. The new paradigm is about digital anyway, or at least doing bank assurance in a digital way. And yeah, that's what HSBC wanted. That's what some of our other partners wanted as well. And it's doing the digital way. Uh, so net once we won't pay anything, but uh, the focus for us is why we're winning them so far is just our tech. I mean, it's that simple. Do you want to talk about restructuring? Well, there will be some restructuring on some of these, yeah, for I, sure. I, th right? I think the fundamental point there is that I've even past years lived with too much integration restructuring costs below the line. So Solvency 2 was below the line. Yeah. You know, there were lots of other things. And, and effectively, there was an incentive to try to throw things over the line and hope nobody would notice. And of course, you know, in the real world, it's actually all expense. It's all cash out the door. So effectively, what we're trying to do is absorb that above the line. So it doesn't mean that there couldn't be integration restructuring costs. Costs, but we're trying to, to absorb more of that above the line, and so the, the quality of our earnings growth going forward should be much stronger as a result. I mean, bluntly, at the half-year results, what you didn't see so clearly is some of the stuff that would historically have been below the line, Tom threw it above the line, and we still had really good growth, as you saw. So we've just been pulling up said no enough because part of our thesis is simplicity and, and we, we still will have integration restructuring costs below the line this year but basically i'm trying to put a moratorium on that so that we're at a minimal amount from next year onward okay. I, I, I noticed the uh, very polite way that that chris is giving the ball i would just throw it but um <laughs> probably drop it is, is blair from merrill's um Two, two questions. Um, Tom, you talked about um, liability management. I think you mentioned 200 million in debt savings. Maybe I got that wrong. Uh, 100 million in 100 interest million. savings. Yeah, I thought it was 100. Yeah, so I was going to ask you that answer to that question. But could you maybe just uh, expand a little bit on the at least 500 million of liability actions that you talked about? That would be interesting. And, um, and then just on the capital uh, ratio, you didn't say too much about that, but presumably still building at the five to ten points that you talked about previously so hence the comment that it's going to go up to you know above 200 percent yeah let, let me give um uh more clear on both of those so what we said was that uh, of the capital management at least 500 million would be capital return in 2018 so that either will be liability management or share repurchase activity or it could be both and I think from my perspective, uh, you know, we did a share repurchase this year. It would be very easy to flip that switch and do another one. The question would be when to do that, what size. But actually, we've seen some interesting ideas on liability management. And uh, in addition to the $900 million of debt that we have in 2018 and another $200 million in 2019, we still have some other um, expensive securities in our capital structure. And I've seen some interesting ideas on how to potentially um, repay some of those and, uh, and, and reduce our interest expense still further. So my priority is to work through some of those ideas. And if we can do them on an economic basis, that's, that's probably what I would try to figure out first before just simply defaulting to another uh, share repurchase. And then in, in terms of what's driving the, um, uh, the, the capital ratio up, um, some of it is, uh, is sort of that, that natural increase that we talked about before. Now, as we increase the dividend payout target, that will start to use up some of that natural growth in the, uh, uh, in the cover ratio. 
But on top of it, uh, I referred to the fact that we've got a pipeline of other capital actions. So we have other things that we're doing that will add to capital over and above the, uh, the natural run rate. And so that'll continue to have us up higher um, at each of the next several year ends, everything else equal. Yeah, it's I mean, we'd rather be going that way than the other way, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but true, it means then true, we have to true. we have to redeploy it. Yeah. Uh, hello, it's Andrew Crean, as you're telling us. Um, two questions: um, the difference between the seven billion and the eight billion uh, cash remittance. Um, could you tell us how much uh, disposal proceeds you had factored into the seven billion? relative to the 1.5 billion disposal proceeds that you've actually achieved. Um, and secondly, uh, could you talk a bit about, you talked about uh, increased corporate costs related to um, IFRS uh, 17, and you talked about them being offset by um, increased longevity reserve releases. Could you put some numbers around those two things? Uh, let me take the second one first. We're not putting numbers around um, on, on longevity releases or the IFRS spend, um, but, but again, just want you to be aware that uh, we've, we've got some offsetting factors there. And so as you think about our uh, – they're going to be different magnitudes um, in, in terms of how you look at all this, um, but, but that will be one of the factors that we need to work through. Uh, and, and again, we've got lots of actuaries and external accountants debating this right now, so you'll just have to take a look at it in our, our results. But frankly, the trends against a 50 billion pound book, you know, suggest that they could be pretty significant. And I'm sure you can work that out yourself, but we're not going to give it all today to you to make it that easy. Um, but th I mean, one is of a different magnitude to the other. And I'd say on the uh, on the divestiture proceeds, we've done better uh, than what we planned. Uh, Chet and Singh and the, the team have done a great job in terms of, uh, of divestiture, so we've realized better prices than we were planning on. But we're also getting uh, better capital generation and, uh, and more capital actions, in particular out of our UK insurance business. And so it's a combination of both higher proceeds and greater special remittances out of the UKI. No, I don't think it's 50-50. And, and again, we, we had sort of a range of estimates on this. So um, it's probably more, uh, uh, more on the, the UKI being more capital efficient and bigger capital actions in UKI than it is on better divestiture proceeds. Um, but again, uh, you know, Chetton's team has executed very well on the M&A side. I mean, you, you can work it out from the, the, the disposals with a bit ahead, but... And, and again, we work in ranges as opposed to yeah. point estimates. So, you know, when you're running a divestiture program, you're not counting on a specific number, and it's been several divestitures. So it's, that's why it's sort of hard to say, is it, you know, X hundred million or, or Y hundred million? Um, good morning, so John from Morgan Stanley. Um, just two questions, please. So on, so on slide 26, where you've got the liquidity mm -hmm. buffer sort of building up, and it says not to scale. Um, but that, that seems to suggest that there's something beyond the numbers you're talking about today. I wonder if you could sort of talk about that. Um, and then secondly, just on the, on the UK, and it's not the sort of subject for today, but you know, looking at the annuity business, there's been a sort of step change there in terms of um, growth, particularly in bulks. Um, you know, what is the size of appetite? I know you've always operated in the small end and the middle end. You know, can you actually step up into the larger schemes? Let me just take the first one first, and I'll also ask Andy to comment on that too. So. Um, we have got a bigger appetite, and if you look at another area of growth, um, actually we hired a, hired a really talented guy called Tom Ground, um, who uh, is brought in and I guess showed us our competitive advantages now, and that is effectively we have a great balance sheet, which you need in that. Um, we have a, uh, I think a market leading asset origination program now. Um, and we also have a brand, and one of the things we talk about in Canada, you know, we do have a desire to move into bulks in Canada as well. And we've got the brand to do it. So, so you'd expect us to see, you'd expect us to see more in bulks than we've done in the past. We've shown that recently with some we've got. Uh, we're getting some decent margins in it. 
Um, and so we're going to use the advantages we got. Now, we're still not going to do the big jumbos, though we'll look at stuff in the market. And Andy, you've, you've been looking at this closely, you want to? Yeah, I'm conscious that uh, in the build-up to this, people are interested to hear about how we're going to grow and also capital actions. We've covered the capital actions. We're covering the international how we're going to grow. Let's just give you a, a, a two minutes on the, the, the UK. So we're basically in the UK, we're benefiting from both the structural growth across the market as a whole and we're gaining share at the same time. I'll give you three, three specific examples. If I take long-term savings, so workplace pensions and platform, last year our net fund flows were 2.8 billion. This year we're looking at approaching 5 billion of positive net fund flows in long-term savings, so strong growth there. If I take bulk annuities, to, to your question, last year we did 600 million. This year we're approaching uh, 2 billion uh, uh, for, for year end, assuming everything comes in that we're expecting to come in by year end. So again, strong growth there. If I take uh, corporate GI in the UK market, so over the last six months or so, our growth there has been double digit. But in particular, what we're focused on there is the profitability of that business. We're not going to go at it hell for leather. So our core for corporate GI is three or four points better this year than it was last year. So, so strong, strong improvement in... Uh, in profitability. But I think what, what I get excited about when I look at all of that, that strong growth is actually the sustainability of it as a result of the composite model. So, so not only do we have the cost and capital efficiency of being a composite player, which means that we can be competitive and generate decent margins at the same time as we grow, but, but in particular, it's the, it's the composite model in terms of relationships. If I just take the corporate market as an example, over 70% of our, our revenue and profit in the corporate market is coming from corporates that are meeting multiple needs with us. So effectively, what it means is whenever they're doing something, we will almost always get the opportunity to pitch. Uh, competitors won't because there tend to be monolines. The relationships means we almost always get the chance to pitch. And then we, we've got to be good enough to win. But if we are good enough, if we're on a par with the competitors, we will tend to win far more because those corporates would rather concentrate with, with, with fewer players. So, so the, I believe those are structural advantages that gives us a sustainable competitive advantage and means that in the UK we can significantly outgrow the market profitably over time. It's the first time ever we've been able to give you proof points of a composite, and, but frankly it's the first time ever where we're actually running it as one UK business now, and that was, uh, was incredibly difficult to put those businesses together. It was quite painful uh, from a regulated perspective, politically, everything else, but it's actually now starting to work, and that's what you see. Picking up on the question on liquidity, uh, you're right, the chart isn't drawn to scale, so you shouldn't take your ruler out and try to figure out exactly what's, what's implied there. Yeah, you know uh, and, uh, uh, it, you know, in my remarks, I said that we were trending up over $4 billion in terms of liquidity. Uh, you know, as, as we look at this, uh, my teams try to build in conservatism and contingencies, et cetera. And as I mentioned, we manage liquidity looking at a two-year forward look of the ins and outs that we have under a stress scenario so that we're trying to manage liquidity very carefully. Um, so, again, I've been pleasantly uh, surprised and pleased with uh, how well we're doing. Uh, but again, I, I think that's a reflection of good work done by the team and, and sort of a natural bias towards conservatism in our financial management right now. Oliver. Thank you. Oliver Steele, Deutsche Bank. Um, so I'm looking at slide 21. Um, it, am I right in thinking that a 55 to 60% payout ratio is implicitly a, as full as you can go, that you're, you're not actually generating any excess capital on top of that, because that's, that's what it seems to suggest. Yeah, well, the, the way I think you should look at this is that um, what we're trying to reflect is a, is a fully normalized basis. So if, if you were seeing cash significantly above the dividend at that point, then you would expect cash forever to sort of build up into an infinite amount. And we don't need those kinds of buffers. We have buffers in the business. We have contingencies. And so this would be reflecting a fully normalized basis, trying to pay you know full amounts of cash out to, out to shareholders. Now. I think as, as I'm looking now at our capital position building up over time and a lot of that capital accumulating in the subsidiaries, I, I think effectively we're holding too much at our subsidiary levels right now. So I'm looking at trying to revisit that and to see whether we can't get more efficient with our, our remittances and try to drive that, uh, that conversion of, uh, of OCG into cash higher than what we're reflecting here. And that would allow us to have even more capacity in the future. Oliver, you remember when we announced the 50% power ratio target, I think you might have asked the same question. And, and I said then, well, let us get to that first, and then we'll see what the quality of earnings is and that. Let's get to this. You know, you, you, we've given the last three years a double-digit growth. 
you're going to get in the foreseeable future now more double digit growth. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's a fairly satisfactory position, but just let us get there. So it's higher than 90. I'm sorry? Yeah, higher. It, should be, it, sh it should be 90 or potentially above. And again, I, I'd caution everyone, these are rough rules of thumb, so this is not a precise, you know, exact science. This depends a bit on business mix, but this will allow us to talk to you a little bit about, you know, what's happening on an underlying basis um, and, and work from there. We, we may actually be a little bit better than that here, but um, as we've tried to model it out over a longer period of time, we, we think this is a, 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 a decent estimation. Yeah. Thanks. It's Ravi Tana from Goldman Sachs. Um, just a couple of questions, please. The first one was on uh, your internal reinsurance um, optimization activities, and I guess following on from your comments that you just made, um, it looks like you've stepped up to quite a large extent the amount that you've reinsured internally between GI, Life, France, etc. I was just wondering what the progress uh, you've made on that is and how much more you can seed from those entities um, and, and to what extent that enables more extraction of surplus from subs. Yeah, we, we've made some progress so we, we use that uh, basically to, to uh, create liquidity out of diversification benefits uh, primarily in the UK with our, um, our life and GI business. We do a little bit in France but we haven't extended that reinsurance vehicle to Canada or to other parts of our business. So I, I would say there's, that's still at a, a fraction of the, the, the theoretical diversification benefit that we have in the group. So uh, that contributes some to liquidity, but not an enormous amount. The second one was kind of related to that, but in terms of the UK cash remittance uplift, um, obviously some, some will have come from what you've just referenced, but also, um, I guess, the Friends Life synergies and uh, asset optimization on the back book. Could you give us a feel for the rough split of, of where the sources of cash are coming from? Yeah, I, I would say if, if you think about the additional cash we're getting here, it's, it's much more fundamentally about capital synergies and capital efficiency in the UKI business. It's much less about our internal reinsurance vehicle, and it's, it's more about fundamental improvement either on a one-time basis because of capital efficiencies and, and, uh, and model improvements uh, or based on um, you know, moving to a, a more capital light model in, in the UK insurance business. So it's just generating more, right? So you've got generation. I mean, it's fair to say Friends continues to give us more than we expected. Um, you know, it looks like it was a good deal. Um, but the, I would focus on the capital generation of the business, which has been strong and it sort of continues. Angel Consagra, HSBC. Uh, two questions, please. Um, first one is, given your comments on the leverage for the group, that it will go down um, and you are comfortable, um, is, there, is there any possibility that you would be raising some more debt uh, to have more excess cash or capital at the group to use for M&A or maybe capital returns in future? And the second one was around the UK bulk strategy. Uh, is like given like the, the this chart here, uh, it seems that you have zero capital strain across all your businesses, including the bulk sales. Uh, what's actually so? If from your excess capital, do you expect more to deploy to bulk annuities if you get a chance? And what's stopping you from doing five billion of sales in a year? John, the first one on me. Uh, no, I'll, I'll take the first one. Um, you know, look, our, our basic plan right now is to uh, is to reduce uh, leverage, ex especially to the extent that it's uh, it's expensive debt. Um, now, by the same token, I look at uh, where rates are today, and you know, in the past we've done a little bit of senior debt funding. Uh, as I look further out in our capital structure, if we found an interesting acquisition or something else to do, and I wanted to finance it with uh, with some low cost senior debt before rates start to you know rise up ahead, I wouldn't rule that out. But that's not sort of the basic plan right now. I've got plenty of liquidity, and I don't really need to do that. But um, you know, if I thought the world was starting to look scary and, and thought it was better to have more resources in the organization, you know, I, again, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't rule that out. And then in terms of uh, capacity for more bulks, we, we certainly have capacity in, in the balance sheet. So uh, the balance sheet is not really constraining us, and it's more you know, what's happening in the business. Yeah, so I, I was thinking about the bolts in, in three bits. You've got the smaller end. We've been a market leader there for a number of years. You've got the mid-size. That's the bit we're actively moving into, such as the Pearson 600 million pound case. And you then got the, the kind of jumbo side. We're not particularly targeting the jumbo side, but I, I, as Mark said earlier, we wouldn't kind of completely rule it out. The, the two things I'd say, first of all, we have a stock of 60 billion of annuities already. 
Um, and about three billion of that pays out each year in terms of annuity payments. So, so, so um, we write one to one and a half billion of individual annuities. And then I've just said we'll approach two billion this year of bulk. So basically, our, even at two billion a year of bulks, our stock of annuities is, is broadly, is, is growing marginally, but not, not significantly. So, so we could do more than that quite easily, and we wouldn't be changing our risk profile. On the capital side of it, that's the whole point of the composite. Because the risks diversify with the general insurance risks, with protection, with long-term savings across the business as a whole, and with our international businesses, it's pretty capital efficient for us. So even if we did write materially more, more bulks, um, uh, as we have done this year, written materially more bulks, yes, there is a capital strain, but it's relatively marginal in the size and scale of the business and diversifies well. It's not going to materially hold back our dividend paying capability because we're a composite and we have the multi-lines and get the diversification. I mean, fundamentally, we have a structural advantage from both capital and underwriting and a structural advantage on the TCC, which is why it's one of the reasons you've seen the increased sales. It's structural. It's structural because you don't get composite businesses anymore. Um, so we have a structural advantage as the market's moved. It's that simple. Yeah. Hi, it's uh, Abedisane from Credit Suisse. Just a follow-up question from the last one. Um, can you just talk about the asset re-risking in annuities and how quickly you can achieve that? And what's the, the follow-on impact on group earnings growth? Yeah, it's, um, uh, you know, we've got a significant appetite for liquid assets right now. They work quite well um, with our annuity business. And so that re-risking uh, is going on naturally over time. Uh, some of it is affecting the new business, and some of it is also in our existing book of business. So the, the Friends Life annuity portfolio that we picked up was heavily in bonds, was not really optimized for solvency too. So we can do some work there, but also do some work uh, on new business as well. And so some of it just depends on our ability to source, you know, high quality liquid assets. So that'll be something that will happen over the next, you know, two, three years um, as, as we move up. I'll tell you where we've got them, where we comment on the liquid assets. Oh, yeah, go for it, yeah. Yeah. Good prompt, Andy. Yeah, just on, on the liquid assets, I mean, we, we're building an origination engine and it's actually, there's a benefit for third party business as well, because some of the assets that we can originate are brilliant assets, but they don't work under Solvency 2 capital sort of matching rules, but they're really appropriate for pension funds. So we're building um, a third party business in infrastructure debt, the liquid lending opportunities at the same time as meeting Andy's demands. So it's, it's one of these benefits and synergies you get. So we, we expect, you know, we, we probably originate in total across third party and for, for Andy's business about four billion this year of this is across infrastructure. Um, private placement debt, structure credit, um, and, and real estate debt, for example. But um, we're planning to ramp that up to a very significant, um, you know, sort of in the next few years, moving five, six, eventually seven billion origination. We don't expect that necessarily that's going to be met with demand from from the, the life business, but we're building um, a, a third party business and obviously defined benefit pension plans love this. So that this is a great opportunity for me in the investment management business to build a, a leading franchise on the back of, of something we have to do anyway corporately. So just to be clear, you guys recall a few years ago we identified this as a weakness um, and it's taken you in a few years to build it up. We now believe in terms of scale, we have the capability of, to generate the most assets of anyone in, in their liquids. That's particularly helpful in the bulks. So it's, it's turned from a relative weakness to a relative strength. And we've invested a fair bit of money in doing it. Um, and that allows us to basically back the annuities. But the, the realization we had bluntly was because we needed those liquids in the rest of our bulk, which increases you know, the yield off that and increases a bit of diversification as well, because we needed it. Basically, the realization was we said to you and just go and build it and keep going. Because we have such an appetite, we'll either take it internally or we'll take it with uh, new bolts. And that's one of the reasons it's working. Right. So it was a change of, it was a realisation the way we were doing it was not that effective. And uh, that was a few years ago. And then Andy after that. So. Thanks. Um just maybe a question for, for Andy, coming back to the UK. Um, you talked 
fairly optimistically about, about growth. You've seen a lot of margin expansion helped, of course, by the stuff that Ewan's doing. Um, you've talked about the annuity side, basically, you know, small amount of growth. You've got the legacy book running off. Quite a lot of growth on the savings side, but it is low margin. So my question is, where, where is the growth going to, do you expect to come from? Is it volume or is there still some margin to come? Because you, you haven't touched on any of your margin uh, targets yes, and you're, I, I, and you're at the top end. It's about UK. I know that, you know I know well, that, but, but it's, uh, it's half your business. Um, you know, you're at the top end of some of your margin uh, range targets already. Yes, so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I am going to, I've kept comments to volume rather than margin today, but the, the margin guidance we've given historically kind of holds good. So in long-term savings, 25 to 30 basis points, I'm not expecting to grow there, but I'm expecting to be in that range. Uh, annuities, uh, uh, the new business range we gave, I think was 75 to 8.5%. Again, we'd expect to be in, uh, in, in that range on annuities and equity release for, for, for new business. Um, what, what we basically saw, Blair, was the, a lot of the margin expansion came about um, as a result of... Uh, um, the cost and capital efficiency benefits of bringing the, the UK business together. That, that will play through and, and uh, uh, um, you know, and, and most of the growth going forward will be driving the volumes in, in those margin ranges. The one kind of variable in that is how much back book uh, illiquids do we do on the annuity side. So if, if we do more of that, then that, that is upside bit, bit beyond, beyond the range. Yeah. The, the, the range is kind of more, you know, more, more uh, assuming a relatively low level of that uh, but, but, but we're risking. But it is it is the structural growth, and, and and don't be you know a lot of people think about the UK market as X growth. It just isn't the case because of the shift from DB to DC, the aging population, auto enrolment. There are strong flows coming in to the uh, both annuities and long term saving markets as a result of that, and, and we're well placed to take advantage. Yes, yeah. Str strongly in three areas. So we're seeing uh, increasingly um, uh, employers are stopping ongoing accrual in their DB pension scheme uh, and putting those those existing people into a, a high contributing DC scheme. So, for example, um, uh, 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 we, we secured the, the scheme for a major steel manufacturer earlier this year that, that, that did that. We've got a number of examples of that. We're seeing a lot of money come into the platform space where individuals are choosing to surrender their DB pension and transfer across to DC. And then we're seeing a strong flow and pipeline of business in bulk annuities. So we've got th three drivers, some into long-term savings, some into annuities. Because that one and a half trillion of assets that are in, the, the, the UK life market is, is you know, 1.75 trillion of assets. DB is 1.5 trillion. Life players don't play in that 1.5 billion of DB. As that shifts across into the UK life sector, that is going to drive that 1.75 trillion uh, that, 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 that we do play in uh, up significantly. And the back book is only 300, 350 billion of that. So the, the, the back book legacy bit, there's an element of drag there, but it is, is, is relatively modest. So, there, there's one other overlay to that as well. It's not just margin of volume. The third one is which part of the value chain are we taking? So what we're seeing is that Aviva Investors, for example, is getting much more. So uh, what's an example? Your platform that's getting really very strong inflows. It was only two years ago, it was getting 12%. Now we're getting, what, 28%? give or take, of the flows are going to Aviva Investors. So we're, we're picking up much more of the value chain. As we move into the digital wallet on payments, we're going to pick up that bit of the value chain as well. So it's actually margin, volume, systemic volume, and picking up more of the value chain. And you can only do that with our infrastructure we built. Uh, really important not to miss it. It's going to be quite significant. I think Andy's next. That's in your... Thanks so much. Andy Hughes from Macquarie. Um, quick question on the DVA in France. Um, is that in the seven or eight billion, the local DVA agreement? And, and even if you get it, I mean, I'm just wondering how big it is. And um, I seem to remember in France there was a delay of a year because of the intermediate holding company and getting dividends to the holding company. So even if you got the DVA local agreement today, it kind of be touch and go for 2018. So. Yeah, we can talk about that a little bit more in some of the breakout sessions later. But uh, what I would say is that we've got a, a model application uh, in now pending approval. We don't have approval for it yet, so it's not in any of our numbers. But we would anticipate uh, getting it at a local level, um, which, which again, helps with uh, our stability of capital here and our dividend paying capacity from France. At a group level, it's, it, it gets reversed out, so it won't affect our overall cover ratio. Yeah, but it's not in the 8, million, 8 billion remittances you're talking about. We haven't right? changed the numbers because of that. No, exactly. We yeah. haven't counted on that in, in that number. So, 
Yeah, I mean, and because we haven't done it yet. Right? And, you're, and you're right. There will be there will be a lag. There will be a delay. <laughs> We're not looking on trying to strip capital out of subsidiaries. Hi, it's Ben Bathurst from SockGen. My question relates to uh, slide 21 up on, the, up on the screen there. Do you have a view yet on whether the 80% is still going to apply on an IFRS 17 basis, or is it safe to assume that that's going to go down? Yeah, what I would say is that we don't have a view on what IFRS uh, 17 will look like uh, you know, when, when that goes live, whenever it, it, it does go live. I, what I would say is that you ought to concentrate on the capital generation and the cash that drives the dividend and whether the IFRS number goes up or down, we'd effectively adjust the payout ratio at that point in time. It's, it's really the underlying capital generation that's driving the dividend. It's not the IFRS number. We've just tried to give you an IFRS bridge here to give you a rough rule of thumb. And just to be in a hobby horse, I think IFRS is nonsense. And um, you think accounting is nonsense? Yeah, well, it is. And and we'll manage the business on a solvency two basis. Um, I think there's a lot of water to flow under the IFRS bridge, and I know a lot of investors share that view. There's been a couple of interesting papers out later. It's something I'm pretty active in. Um, I don't know. I expect to see it delayed, frankly. Just to be a little bit controversial to help, help the day. Um, since Blair has opened you up to asking about targets in other operations, I'm just wondering if I can ask Ewan about his targets. Um, I mean, the aims, the, 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 the absolute return market's been a little bit more difficult this year, so I'm just wondering, in, in view of that, how, how comfortable you are that you can achieve your pretty punchy targets. Yeah, well, I think the only targets I've disclosed are double digit growth in earnings, which we are pretty pretty confident about um, for the foreseeable future. Um, I accept that um, AIM's uh, returns haven't been particularly exciting this year, but in actual fact, the sort of the, as, a, as a strategy, you know, multi-strat funds haven't done particularly well. And in terms of uh, a marketplace where simply owning the market, beta has performed very well those kind of strategies aren't doing so well in, in retail space. But what we're finding is that in institutional marketplaces where particularly for big insurers, big pension funds, where they can't really countenance just buying a S&P Spider and relying on the equity market going up. They've got liabilities, they've got to have a responsible investment strategy, plus they're advised by consultants. Um, we've got tremendous loyalty and we're still seeing flows in from the, the big consultancies for large corporate pension plans. So we have seen some outflows from retail wholesale investors who, not surprisingly, are looking at the performance saying it had done much better with a simpler balanced fund structure or something of that nature, where we have the opportunity to explain to skilled investors, CIOs, consultants, the investment philosophy and, and, and why it is and what we're worried about that we've been protecting against that hasn't really materialised in the year we've been in. Um, those are good conversations and we're still seeing flow. So this year you can expect to see good solid flow into, into AIMS despite the performance. But I think, you know, if you remember the, the progress chart that I put up for, for my business about a year ago, we talked about you know, 2016 being a year where really the ambition for Aviva investors was to be the one to watch to get ourselves onto the map as a respectable fund manager. This year was all about consolidating that position and winning mandates. And 2018, the strap line was diversified excellence. And what we're seeing is we're starting to win in a number of other areas. So we've had some quite big institutional wins in areas like global high yield, got a good pipeline in alternative income strategies. And so I'm quite encouraged that you know, by the end of 2018, you won't just be talking to me about AIMS. I hope AIMS is still a hero proposition and I'm doing all I can to make sure that investment performance is more exciting than it's been in the last 18 months. But it won't, Aviva investors won't be defined by, by AIMS. Colin Kelly, UBS. Um, first question just on the remittances. Obviously, the 90% remittance from business units to group is quite a, a high number. It's how you view the progression going forward. Does that include an expectation to more thinly capitalize subsidiaries to a greater extent? from here and secondly you know confidence around those remittance ratios in the context of 
as you mentioned, the annuity business will, will be lower given capital intensity, but also some of the international businesses like Canada and Poland have you know, quite strict regulators and in the past there's been issues around trap capital and some of those subsidiaries. So just confidence around achieving these levels of remittances, albeit they're, you know, they're estimated numbers rather than in fact. I mean, firstly, what Tom's alluded to before, we've actually been building up um, a lot of both capital and liquidity in those businesses. And so what you're seeing, the projections, um, doesn't actually take account of any of that. It's what Tom was saying before, we've actually got further what we can do. We think it's probably building up too much as well. And, but that actually wasn't the reason for the upgrades and the targets. We can go there as well. So that's why we just got a whole lot more confidence. We have been building it up. One of the reasons, bluntly, is when you bought Insolvency 2, when you have, I don't know how many actions you've got, about 1,500 of them? Probably a few too many. Um, when you have so many layers upon layer upon layer of actuaries, you build up conservatism in, in the business, and that means the business have, have been building it up. We can go there, we haven't yet. Does that sort of help you make sense? Yeah, I, I just simply confirm that, that uh, the, the way we derived these figures was not by trying to squeeze more out of the subsidiaries, but I actually think that's an area of potential upside in, in those numbers. And then um, in terms of your other questions around trap capital, I mean, you'll hear more about Poland and Canada today. You can talk about that. Actually, we've made progress here in Poland, so we don't have a whole lot of trap capital in a number of places. Um, so, again, we feel pretty good about that number. Yeah, I think it was, was it Andy's point before on, on France, for example, DVA isn't built in these figures, although we know we, know we got it, but, and that will, be, that will come later. Um, just the second question then, following up on your comment around IFRS and speaking to, to a number of you yesterday evening, I mean, given the lack of relevance of IFRS for a life insurance business, given IFRS 17 is on the way, given Solvency 2, disclosures and the ability to build that out, is, is that an opportunity to move away? Obviously, you still have to report IFRS, but is it an, an opportunity to move away or is there an appetite to move business metrics away from IFRS more toward capital and cash flow as you run your business, given IFRS is creating you know, nothing more than, than constraints that are not necessary? That's a tough one because you know the generalist investor that may be investing across sectors, not just insurance or financial services, is used to looking at IFRS. So that's one of the reasons why we're trying to tell a simplified story here, because we do want to be attractive to generalist investors without a lot of the complexity. In terms of how we run the business, we primarily are focusing on sort of solvency two metrics in terms of where value. I mean, internally, we look at an economic value added model. So we're we're running based on sort of the real cash and capital internally and then translating that into the external reporting that you're seeing here. So um, as much as we might love to uh, deal with, with only one set of accounts, we're going to continue to have to uh, you know, run with multiple sets of accounts for the foreseeable future. Um, hello, it's Andrew Crean again. Um, I think you've managed to achieve what no horticulturist can do, which is to turn an apple tree, one into an oak, <laughs> another, another one into an acorn. Uh, for, na for now, um, I think was the operative words. Could you explain um, where you are with India? I think you're the 23rd out of the 24 private companies. What is, what's your thinking there? And particularly in Italy, um, I think in the past you uh, said you don't control the brand, you don't control the distribution, uh, and that was the reason it was an apple. Um, I don't think either of those things have changed, so why is it an oak? Let me, let me start with, with India. So India is currently under strategic view, but, but rather than you automatically determine those two words mean something, let me add a little bit more, a little bit more color. We actually like the market dynamics. I mean, what, what's happened with the Endahar system and 98% of the population being in a digital ecosystem, either by ocular or, or by fingerprint, we think actually bodes, bodes really well. Our challenge in India is, frankly, we don't have the right distribution. So it's under strategic view, and uh, obviously, if we can find the sort of partners that we'd like, then it's probably an attractive market for all the fundamentals I spoke, speak about. And if not, then it's probably um, we'll have you know a further decision to be taken. Be a bit more definitive, I think. Uh, I think we'll exit it if we don't if we don't get the right the right partnership model. Um, but, but we would expect. Um, you can assume uh, you can assume we're active uh, in that market, and you can assume we think the market has potential 
So for the right deal, we'll, um, we'll do it. The, the, other, the other key element, of course, that we have said before, we've hinted before, is that the 15-year part, the, our contractual arrangements in that joint venture changed, right. the 15-year time frame. So we now have much more ability to uh, choose more to influence the outcome of discussions in that market. And the market has changed, so when the environment changes, you reassess. Um, uh, I don't think we said it was a no, because I think we said it was an acorn, didn't we? What did we say it was on that thing? Eh? Oh, it used to be an apple tree, so we've turned an apple tree into an acorn. Done that. Very yeah. clever. Um. <laughs> let, let me come on the Italian business. So on, on the Italian business, we made a strong year last year. Our printing profit, you know, before you deduct minority interest, was, was $250 million. We saw strong growth. As I alluded to, we've gone from 12th in the market to 7th in the market. That's on the back of... Um, strong sales, uh, largely coming from our hybrid product, which is you know 30% with profit at a par guarantee and 70% unit length. There's a small protection wrapper in that. It isn't you know the, the assumption is that it's all from the the three big the three bank insurance partners now now too as, as as you know a big part of those sales are also coming from the IFA channel um, Finico. The reason we put a new CEO in is the distribution. We like the market, but the distribution strategy is not sound. So obviously we want to we want to grow our IFA channel. We want to grow, you know, our own distribution. The comment, you know, because I should comment on Banco Populare. Listen, that was a deal where they came to us. We didn't like the terms, um, and quite frankly, we had a strong contract, so we played the put option. What we actually lost there was general insurance. We lost about forty odd million of operating profit. That was general insurance. So if I was to look at what I can replace quite easily through our GI brokers, it was the Banco Populare deal. So. You know, we're, we're, we're committed, but it's the same as France. You know, we put a new CEO in France, and you've got to give them time to build the right strategy. But it's a market with fundamentals that we like. It's the seventh largest insurance market in the world. Um, but we're going to reset our strategy, and that's, that's why it's now there as, a, as an oak. Hi, Michelle Bardier, Joe Hambro. Uh, another question for International. Uh, you mentioned about this ambition of traveling uh, the market cap of Turkey. Could you talk about uh, the capital requirement that you would need to achieve that? And what's a realistic time frame for that to be kind of like as part of our thought process? Yeah, Thanks. I'm not going to go into the specific capital requirements today, but let me give you a little bit of, of the ambition. Our partner in Turkey is the Sabanci Group, so they also own Akbank. And we look at that market, 50% of the population is, is under the age of 30. Um, auto enrollment went in on, on January 1st. And like most jurisdictions, it's a thinly margin product, but we're well positioned to probably acquire a new million customers. And with our platforms, that then gives us the chance to, to look at, look at cross-sell opportunities. This business has been growing strongly. Uh, the CAGR at the half year was 20%. And what I will say, it's accelerated from there. So um, it's a market with, the, with our partner that we're quite comfortable with that target. And that's a target we've actually shared publicly in the Turkish market. Maybe there's, I could feel another uh, analyst day coming on in Turkey, which is a yeah. uh, pretty interesting market. Yeah. Turkey's, Turkey and markets like this, so I think it's like Asia was 15 years ago. You, know, uh, you don't have the same level of competition. Um, distribution and brand's important. You know, we're number two in this market, we're number right. two in that market as well. Uh, that's a market I really, really like. 80 million people. Uh, 80 million people, fast growth, a government that's earned some pretty interesting stuff across the board, I guess, but pretty interesting stuff in terms of particularly savings. Um, and you know, we've, I'm all right saying, I think we've signed up over a million customers in the last 12 months, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's big, big growth at big, big numbers. The government needs to fix the opt-out ratio for us, but that's their yeah. concern as well, yeah. so. Yeah, they do. Time for one or two last questions. <clears throat> Final ones. I don't know. Okay, so we've got... We've got coffee. Yes. We've got some. The afternoon is focused on these other growth markets. So I think uh, I think Blair said you know, half the business is the UK. So now we'll focus on the other half after lunch, um, and um, give us your feedback. Tell us what you think.